So hello everyone, welcome to the senior leadership track. Uh, I was really looking forward to today's session, connecting the dots to company financials by Kumar Ganagopal and there he is, you can see him. Uh, so anybody who's uh, heard his sessions in either STC or TC world, I think is looking forward to the session. Uh, you know, financials was the number one ask when we did a sort of needs analysis from the managers. So I think uh, this will be really useful to everybody. Uh, important to everyone as well. Uh, and let, of course, Kumar introduce himself and objectives of the session. But before we do that, uh, just um, <laughs> a couple of points, uh, and we are waiting for a few more people to join in. Um, so if anybody has joined in using the WebEx link directly uh, and not part of the Manage the Docs group on LinkedIn, please do go ahead and join in the manage the docs group also the twin group i'm sure all of you are part of twin at least uh, but do join the group on linkedin um, also i think those who attend uh, five sessions in every track uh, uh, you know get a certification at the end of five sessions um, so we do have a participant list and you also have to fill out the feedback form at the end of the session so do you know stick around for that uh, so again, uh, once again, if you haven't joined the Manage the Docs group on LinkedIn, please do go ahead and join in. So we have about 20 participants right now and few more might join in over the next few minutes. So, but we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome Kumar. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, making the time for this session. Uh, he's joining in from the Bay Area, uh, California. So it's a little later in the evening for him. And it's a cold, chilly morning in Bangalore here. So welcome, Kumar, and uh, please go ahead. Sandhya, for Close the reception. Go ahead. And request everyone to mute yourselves unless you are asking a question or speaking. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, those were warm uh, words, Sandhya. Thank you so much for the welcome. Uh, kind of set very high expectations. I wish I'd been there in person to meet you all. Uh, maybe after the uh, pandemic is behind us, we can all get to meet in person and, and talk more about this topic and others. So uh, thanks everyone for joining this session. I was invited today to talk about finance specifically. I'll introduce you to how corporate finance works. Um, I was telling Sandhya earlier that I don't quite know the profile of everyone participating today in this session. So kind of driving in the dark with respect to your expectations and also any prior knowledge you might have on the topic of corporate finance. Um, if you're familiar with the basics of balance sheets, profit and loss statements, cash flows, and things like that, then this introduction might be a little too basic for you but it might still be a useful um, refresher. If you'd like uh, more clarity about anything I say uh, during the presentation, please uh, feel free to ask questions. I'll also leave sufficient time at the end, uh, maybe around 10 to 15 minutes, maybe even more uh, to discuss questions. Let me start with um, a quick introduction to myself, a uh, little more than uh, you guys might know. So I'm a tech writer, like uh, most of us in this group. I've been in the technical communication profession in various roles for around 20 years now. Um, currently, I'm a cross-product solutions writer with uh, Google. Uh, but before joining the tech writing industry, I was um, a financial and a cost analyst for a few years. And even after switching over to technical writing, I um, continue to be interested in everything finance, including how our work as technical communicators adds value um, or should add value to the uh, business goals of the companies and organizations that we work with. Um, let's look now at, at the uh, main topics that we're going to cover today. We'll try and understand why corporate finance matters to all of us. Um, next, we'll go over what kind, what some of the specific financial numbers mean. I'll end my talk with uh, a few pointers to 
what um, each one of us can do to become more finance savvy, so to speak. And as we start on this journey of uh, financial um, discovery, I'd like to remind myself first and also all of us that um, how each of our organizations handles and, and manages corporate finance varies significantly. And, and the reason for that is because um, every business is different, right? Clearly. So a company that, for example, um, makes and sells cars um, or cell phones needs to manage its operations very differently from, say, a bank or an insurance provider, right? Or um, a hospital or a school or a software development company. Um, the, the products, the technologies, and the people that make up each of these organizations are very different. And their goals are different. The, the core, um, but the core principles and, and the um, standards that govern corporate finance are, um, could say uniform across various industries for the most part. Now, the specifics of um, accounting and budgeting, pricing, um, financial reporting, management control, those might vary across industries, but the fundamental principles and standards are fairly uniform. Uh, so this, the knowledge that you gain uh, from this session today can be used across industries, even though there are differences. But please keep this in mind, uh, particularly when you compare for any reason financial performance of companies that operate in, in different spaces and industries, right? So this understanding uh, would also be useful when, for example, you change jobs. Right? And in the process, you move, for example, from IT hardware to IT services or to manufacturing or to retail or whatever. So uh, just be aware that there are differences in how financial goals are set and measured. We know that every business is different, but um, regardless of the industry that your company operates in, um, all of our stakeholders, the key stakeholders, fall into a few common uh, groups of um, you know, people, right? Together, these groups make up what I would call the, the, the business ecosystem of the company. Um, so what is this business ecosystem, right? So at the core of this business ecosystem uh, are our customers. They are the ones who keep our company going. Go ahead, Sandhya. Was there a question? Okay. Uh, so the, the no. customers, go ahead, Sandhya. No, no, not me, sorry, carry on. Okay, all right, no problems. So customers keep our company um, afloat, going, right, financially. Other than customers, another key uh, group of stakeholders is our investors and the shareholders, right? So these are possibly the most critical stakeholders after our customers. Um, so our exec management, our board of directors are responsible to these shareholders. Shareholders and investors expect our company to deliver results, right? Which can be in the form of annual uh, dividend payouts, which is how companies pay out profits to the investors. Another important result that shareholders expect is um, appreciation in the stock price of the company. Now, speaking of stocks, the stock market is a very funny animal. Um, predicting its behavior is, I think, uh, in my opinion, an art more than a science. I'm not an expert in this area. My personal take is that stock movements are um, mostly governed by emotions, um, like hope or fear and um, greed to some extent. Um, Besides financial performance and expectations, of course, right? There are these emotional factors. And often because um, investors and speculators in the stock market have competing options for where they can park their money. Uh, so they can invest their money in our company's stock or in the stock of another company, right? Um, so therefore our company's performance and future 
in isolation is not the only factor that drives the price of our stock. Strange as that may seem, right? Our relative performance when compared with the other players in the industry as well matters, right? Besides the emotional factors that we discussed earlier. So enough said about investors. Another important category um, of stakeholders for any company is partners. Now these could be technology partners, sales partners, and so on, right? Our partners typically have some sort of a financial stake in our operations. For example, um, technology partners might receive or they might even pay us a royalty for uh, intellectual property that we co-develop with them. Sales partners might participate uh, sometimes financially in our marketing and uh, promotional activities, for example. Um, besides partners, another important, uh, I guess, group of- uh, Hi, Kumar, sorry to interrupt, but could you speak a little louder? I think it's a little low. Uh... Okay. Let me see if I can adjust okay. my headphones. Okay. Is this better? Yes, it's somewhat better. Yeah, okay. thank you. Right. Okay, I'll speak a little louder. Thanks, Sandhya. So banks and financial institutions are, um, are, are the stakeholders who kind of are the financial enablers for any company, right? Alongside investors, um, banks and financial investors also monitor our company's performance financially closely. And they're particularly concerned about things like uh, profitability and our cash flow situation. We'll take a look at these metrics more closely a little later. Um, the next group is, is vendors. So for any company to operate, it needs to buy goods and services from other vendors and um, companies pay vendors for their goods and services, sometimes in advance of the purchase, sometimes at the time of purchase, but typically a few days or a few weeks after the goods and services are delivered. So our vendors have a very keen interest in the financial well-being of our company. And our vendors want to make sure that first, our company continues to use their goods and services, and second, the vendors want to be sure that we are generating enough revenue to be able to pay them um, on time. Um, all of us, the employees, of course, make up yet another important part of the uh, business ecosystem. We are typically uh, salaried. Some of us earn commissions and bonuses, and uh, many companies offer stocks as well. So clearly, we as employees want to see our companies succeed. And for those of us who get stock, we want to see our stock prices go up consistently. So we have an interest in the financial performance of our companies. The governments of the, um, the countries that our companies do business in have significant influence and control over how our companies operate, right? One obvious touch point is a uh, touch point between companies and, and the government is uh, corporate income taxes, for example. There are lots of other taxes, including taxes at the local level, city level, state level. And, and companies are also bound by government regulations about uh, labor practices, insider trading, exporting and importing uh, goods, foreign exchange transactions, and the list goes on. So much so that many companies have a department that's dedicated to uh, governmental affairs. Um, and last but not the least, uh, no company can operate in isolation. It needs to keep the interests of the society in general in mind. Um, corporate social responsibility or CSR is a big thing these days. The, the larger the company typically, the larger is the social scrutiny that the uh, company undergoes. Now, why does all this all of this matter to us, right? So why do we need to learn about the business ecosystem of our company? For two reasons. First, each one of us needs to be realistic and acknowledge that as employees and even as teams, 
um, we are important stakeholders. There's no doubt about it, but there are numerous other stakeholders that our companies care about. And some of those other stakeholders might be more important uh, at times to our companies than us as employees. That's a very sobering thought, right? But, but it's the reality. The, the second reason why knowledge about our business ecosystem matters is because a basic awareness of this ecosystem might help us understand and maybe even rationalize um, business changes that otherwise might appear a little strange to us. So, for example, our management might announce a, a, a freeze in hiring all of a sudden or there might be drastic reductions in the travel budget. Um, a product might get canceled all of a sudden. The company might stop operating in a location or a country that seemed to be important um, in the past. Another example is leadership might undergo a dramatic overhaul, right? Um, so whenever any such change occurs, um, knowing our businesses ecosystem and, and the players in the ecosystem and evaluating which group of stakeholders matters the most to our company might help us understand the rationale for that change, right? So that's the second reason. But understanding our business ecosystem is just the, it's an important step, but it's just the first step toward understanding corporate finance. We also need some knowledge of the key financial metrics that uh, matter to our company. So what are those metrics? Broadly, the financial goals that most companies care about can be grouped into uh, four categories at a very high level. These are growth, profitability, liquidity, and leverage. Um, we look at each one of these metrics and what, what it means. Um, We'll discuss the basics today. There's no time for a deep dive, but I'm hoping that this overview will, will help you get started. If you're interested in uh, digging deeper into these topics. So what is growth? Growth indicates um, our company's ability to sell more, to grow in the future, and to continue to provide value to our customers, right? So what are the some of the key questions that we need to think about when we're looking at growth? So the questions are, are we generating more revenue when compared with, for example, the previous period, whatever that is? Are we getting more revenue from existing customers? Are we adding new customers? These could be customers and users who are new to the industry itself, so-called greenfield users. It could also be customers who have previously bought products from our competitors? Are we getting market share away from our competitors, right? Those are all growth indicators. Recording. Are we adding any new products and, and services to our catalog, right? These are all uh, questions to think about when you're looking at revenue. In terms of investment, the questions we can ask ourselves um, are, is our company spending more in research and development? over the years. Are we investing in capital assets like new factories if you're in manufacturing, new data centers if you're in cloud, equipment, um, right? Are we acquiring other businesses for growth? Uh, and the third uh, growth factor is, is value. What do our customers value in our company? Are we continuing to differentiate in terms of product, um, pricing, quality, service, brand, technology, right? So these are all uh, areas to think about for the third point. Hey, uh, Sudhir, see, this is cool under my, uh, G. Le Panjish Nada, Sudhir. Hmm? Or Sudhir. Hmm. Raghuram, could you please um, mute yourself? Can... Mute yourself? Yeah. Or Anu, maybe you can mute if you're the host. I just did that, uh, Sandhya. All right. Thanks, Anu. So of these three questions regarding growth, the, the answers to the um, questions around revenue and uh, investments can be found easily from our financial reports. But the answer to the value question is tricky. 
And often that's the one that actually determines the growth potential of our uh, company. But at times, employ all hands and internal discussions with our customer facing teams, particularly um, sales teams, can help us gather uh, useful insights about the, the value question. Now let's take a look at uh, profitability, the second uh, financial metric. Probably the simplest of uh, all the metrics and the one that's most well understood, profitability has two components, whether we are earning more revenue sales than the money we are spending to make the products and services that we sell. And how healthy is our margin? That is the percentage of every dollar of revenue that shows up directly on the bottom line as our profit. Uh, so compare this percentage versus previous periods uh, and also versus the competition, right? So that's that's useful analysis to do. Our public, our company's financial reports that are made public um, include both profit and margin information. So this metric is relatively easy to find and track. Uh, let's look at liquidity now, the third factor. So liquidity indicates uh, whether we have enough cash um, to meet our, uh, to operate the business. Right, uh, that is money to buy goods and services and to pay salaries and so on. And also money to meet our financial commitments, that is interest on any loans we've taken and, and repaying the loans and so on. We should remember um, that more profit does not mean more cash or more liquidity, right? A company might be extremely profitable, but it might be suffering a temporary um, cash crunch. For example, say your company strikes um, a big deal, a sales deal with a customer, and, and you ship the product or service um, that the deal is about in the last month of the financial year. Let's say December of the year, right? Now, your company might offer uh, important customers a one month credit period, which means the customer has um, time up to a month after the sale to pay for the product or service that they purchased. Now, in this case, for that financial year ending December, the revenue and the profit numbers might look good, very good, because they reflect this big deal that you struck. Um, but the money from the deal is still not in the bank, right? So your company might end up borrowing short term from banks, for example, to pay for making the products and providing the services. So this is a scenario where you're profitable, but you have a cash flow situation, right? So um, the cash flow and profit are often um, conflated and misunderstood. You need to know that they are very different and both are equally important to understand. Liquidity information also is, is readily available in public financial records, so it's easy to find and track. Now let's look at the last of the uh, four key metrics, which is leverage. This is probably the least well understood of all the metrics. It indicates whether we are funding uh, or, or financing our business efficiently. It also indicates our ability to assume um, financial risk for the sake of growth, right? It's like are you willing to take a loan to buy a house? Or are you a little risk averse and you would rather live in a rented house, accumulate the money, and then use your own funds to buy a house, right? It's a similar thing happening with businesses. Um, debt is what we borrow as a company from banks and financial institutions, for example. And equity is our shareholders' money. It includes the money that the shareholders have invested by purchasing shares. And it also includes the company's um, after-tax profits, which are not distributed as dividends, right? This is sometimes called retained earnings. So you've earned the money, but you've not distributed it and you've kept it for the uh, shareholders. So leverage is measured as a ratio. It's, uh, it's called the debt to equity ratio. 
you can easily calculate this ratio for your company from the published financial uh, results. A company that has a relatively high um, debt to uh, equity ratio is considered highly leveraged. The company is essentially using borrowed money to fund its operations and uh, growth. Uh, this is a good strategy if the return that the company um, expects to generate is higher than the cost of borrowing uh, the funds, right? So you pay some money to borrow the funds and you're generating some returns from using the funds. If, if you're generating more money, then you're paying less and so you have some margin left with you. But an extremely high uh, debt to uh, equity ratio when compared with, for example, other companies operating in the same industry uh, might signal the problem. So there's more risk with leverage, but it also presents opportunities for, for uh, growth. And leverage data too, uh, it's not readily available, but it, you can extract it from corporate financial reports by looking at uh, the liability numbers and the uh, retained earnings. Now, um, for the past few minutes, we've been talking about a few financial metrics. We've talked about revenue, profit, um, loss, cost, cash, investment, debt, equity, and so on. Let's take a closer look at how the operations of a typical company would affect each of these financial metrics. So imagine that um, we're just starting out with our own new business, right, from scratch. Typically, the first thing we would do is either borrow money, um, by taking a loan from banks and financial institutions or bring in the money uh, by issuing equity shares or maybe uh, seek funding from venture capitalists, right? So that's what we would first do. And then you would, uh, we would build the necessary equipment, the infrastructure and so on to start our operations. After that, we would uh, make our products and develop the services that we want to offer and sell. And finally, we would sell these products and services and start generating revenue from customers. Let's take a closer look at what happens on the accounting side as we run through this typical cycle, right? So when we bring in equity capital, and when we borrow money, our cash and bank balances increase. And we also start accruing some liabilities on the balance sheet, right? When we invest in land, set up buildings, and buy equipment, we start creating what, what are called fixed assets in our balance sheet. And to pay for these assets, we might spend some of the cash that we got, uh, got from loans or equity capital. We might also accrue some more liabilities for payments that some of our equipment vendors allow us to make in the future. When we start making the products and services that we want to sell, uh, we start buying raw material, we start paying salaries, we incur some overhead expenses for rent, utilities, and so on. And this is a phase when we as technical writers contribute directly to the product development and uh, release cycle. In this phase also, uh, the, companies pays out, the company pays out um, cash and it may also accrue some um, short-term liabilities. And if we were a manufacturing company, we would start building inventory of uh, saleable products as well. And finally, when we sell our products and services, our um, revenue increases, and as customers start paying for their purchases, our cash flow improves, right? And so this cycle continues. Now, admittedly, this was an extremely simplistic depiction of how business operations map to financial transactions. But I hope you get the uh, general idea. Now, our activities as technical writers also cost uh, the company some money, right? Where does our cost go? How does it get accounted? Um, why does this even matter? So knowing how our costs are accounted 
as technical writers helps us understand our impact on our company's revenue, cost, and profit. And this knowledge also helps us understand the risks and the opportunities that are inherent to our uh, jobs and to our roles. It's worth noting um, at this point that the effect of our salaries and our costs on, the, on a company differ depending on whether we work in product companies or services companies, right? So let's take a closer look at that. This slide shows the uh, summary of financial results for two fictitious companies. The numbers are purely illustrative. Um, IT products companies typically, typically have a larger indirect cost component, this part here. Um, so this is typically the research and development cost. As uh, the company is developing new products, the under cost is high. The, uh, this, and at this point, the, the revenue is near zero because you're still developing the product. And as the product ships and you start selling, the revenue increases and the R&D cost, this fixed part does not rise proportionately with revenue. So at that point, most of the revenue um, flows directly into the bottom line, right? Because this part is fixed relatively. With services companies, the, the work that many employees do is typically billable. That is, our clients pay an agreed upon hourly rate or a monthly rate, um, which is usually higher than what the company pays to the employees, right? So the um, R&D cost is close to zero or relatively low in services companies, but the cost of revenue or the direct cost is a little higher. The idea behind this comparison was to demonstrate that the impact of each of us, impact that each one of us has on our company's financials uh, varies depending on whether we are a billable employee or an R&D employee, right? So that's a key distinction that we need to understand. So what exactly is this impact? In services companies, I said earlier that employees' costs are mostly billable, recoverable from clients, right? Um, and so the costs vary almost proportionately with the business or the revenue for the most part. But in product companies, a significant proportion of our costs, employee costs, constitute what's called indirect cost, which is relatively fixed in the short to medium term. Regardless of revenue, you might have zero revenue, you still have some cost. You might have an astronomical growth in revenue and the cost might not increase that proportionately, right? Now, how does this difference between services and product companies matter to us as employees? If you work in services companies, um, you'll notice almost an immediate and direct relationship between revenue and cost, as I've shown in this graph. So um, the if the company has a steady pipeline of revenue, then uh, the margin and the profits are also stable. And so operational metrics like hiring, um, salary hikes, bonuses, are reasonably predictable, at least in the short term or the medium term. Now let's compare this with the revenue and cost behavior in product companies. In product companies, you'll notice a less direct relationship between revenue and cost. In the long term, there is a relationship, but the relationship is less proportional. Um, during some periods, you will see that revenue grows significantly faster than cost. Uh, this might indicate that the company is, is seeing the rewards of products that were developed in previous periods. In other years, cost could grow rather alarmingly and revenue might grow at a slower rate or even stagnate. 
right? This could be because at that time we are investing maybe aggressively developing new products um, and we have not yet started generating revenue from all of them. So I call this a delayed impact, right? So the impact of an investment decision in a product company is not felt immediately. Uh, impact of uh, a drop in sales is not felt immediately. There's usually a time lag between when employee related decisions are taken in product companies um, and when the, the trigger for that action happened, right? Um, again, this is an extremely simplified view of the key differences between services and product companies. Uh, to make sense of these financial numbers, it would be useful to track certain other environmental factors that affect our revenue, our cost, and margin. I'd like to offer a very short list of the key factors that, as employees, we can and should monitor. So at the micro level, it helps to understand the business model of our organization. So what I mean by this is, how do we generate sales? What's our cost structure? Which products are profitable? Which products are not profitable? What technologies are we focusing on? Which technologies are we investing in? I also suggest that we, the, we monitor the key financial metrics um, quarterly, if possible, right? So at a minimum, watch the numbers for uh, revenue, margin and profits, cash from operations, debt versus equity. Understand the, um, the role of your team in the organization. Are you considered a cost center or a profit center? Now, this knowledge would help us understand the rationale for certain executive decisions around things like hiring, uh, budgeting, and growth. And without this, this understanding, these decisions might seem a little skewed to us, right? We might not, we might think they don't make sense. Also, if, if you happen to be a cost center, um, you're not generating revenue, is your work dedicated to a specific business division or a product, or are you a shared resource, right? Now, either model has some pros and cons from an individual employee's perspective. Um, so for example, if my costs are shared across several divisions or products, then a business problem in one of those divisions or products might not affect me directly as an employee. At the same time, on the flip side, if a particular division or product, which is among the many that I'm supporting, is doing extremely well, then any um, salary or bonus rewards that are tied to business performance might not be available to me because I'm a shared resource. I'm not directly tied to that uh, highly performing product or division. Can knowing about the operating model help us as managers and team leads influence the, the operating model in some way? The answer depends, I think, on our sphere of control as managers. But at a minimum, this knowledge, knowing the operating business model uh, and knowing uh, whether we are shared or dedicated, helps us hold um, meaningful conversations around compensation and budgets and so on with exec management and also with our own uh, team members. So besides these micro level factors, um, I'd also like to suggest a few higher level uh, environmental factors that we should track. The first of them is how mature is the industry that your company operates in? How mature is the business of the company itself? Are we, for example, in the startup phase? Um, are we in the fast growth phase? Are we in the maturity phase? Or are we in the decline phase, right? So for a company that operates in, in multiple markets and develops many products, the answer might be specific to each market or product. And another question to consider um, is who your competitors are. How are they performing relative to your company in terms of sales and profitability? 
Yet another factor is foreign exchange uh, fluctuations. So if your company operates globally, how do changes in foreign exchange rates affect your business? For example, if you're an Indian um, IT services company with customers predominantly in the European Union, uh, a strengthening euro is good news in terms of revenue because you'll earn more rupees for the same volume of business. On the other hand, if you happen to import significant volumes of goods and services from a country in the European Union, then a strong euro is very bad news because you'll end up paying more in uh, rupee terms for the same volume of goods and services. Um, so another factor that at the at the macro level is um, corporate taxation. The corporate uh, taxation rules affect the net profit of your company and the cash available for investment and growth. Now, this is by no means an exhaustive list. There are a few factors. Um, there are many other factors. These are a few of the factors that are relatively easy to track, even when corporate finance is not our daily business. Um, so that brings me to nearly the end of my session. I'd like to close with a few key um, takeaways. The first thing is it's reasonably easy for anyone to keep up with company finances. All we need is a little interest and some motivation. We, we don't need to be financial experts or have training in corporate finance to be able to do this. Every decision we uh, make as a technical writing team, every action we take, um, be it about hiring, or training, performance management, um, content strategy, content experience, graphics, localization, production tooling, whatever it is, has an impact on our company's financials. The third takeaway is financial numbers almost never um, tell us the whole story about the financial health of our company. We need to dig a little deeper, keep our um, ears and eyes open within the company. Look for news from outside sources. Monitor important developments at competing players. Attend industry conferences if you can, and so on. So th these would help us build a more holistic view of our company's uh, financial health. So we've barely scratched the surface of um, corporate finance now. What more can we do to learn further, right? I'd, I'd like to end with a few specific suggestions. Make it, I would suggest that you make it a personal and a professional goal to understand better how exactly your company makes money or how it plans to make money, if it's a startup, for example. Do you know which products are expected to generate the most revenue and profits for your company? Find out which products are strategically important and which are not. The second thing that I would suggest is to assess your company's health regularly. The balance sheet is a publicly available financial report. It's a valuable starting point. It's a snapshot in time of your company's financial um, status. It's typically published quarterly. Um, if detailed financial reports uh, would be too much and if they would overwhelm you, Start by looking at just a few key metrics. For example, for whatever company you're working for, go and look up the debt to equity ratio. Remember that a persistently high debt ratio might not be a good sign. So also, you can check whether retained earnings or shareholder equity numbers are higher when compared with uh, the previous period. Now, that's a good thing. Check the liquidity situation, that is the bank balances and marketable securities. Now, too much liquidity is not good. It indicates that your company might be um, too much cash is not good because your company might be sitting on opportunities and not acting on them. But too little liquidity is dangerous as well. You're running dry. It's like trying to uh, climb a mountain while running low on oxygen, right? Um, the last thing is to watch your company's operations. For this, you can study the company's uh, profit and loss statement, which is 
a summary of the operations of your company for a given period in financial terms. Check whether the top line, that's the revenue, and the bottom line, that the, that's the profit, are growing consistently. Um, so that wraps up what I wanted to share today, folks. Uh, thank you again for joining this session. I hope you find it useful. I'm very grateful to the organizers, um, Sandhya, Akash, Asha, uh, Lien, for giving me this opportunity to share what I know with you all. And thank you also, Sharath and Anu, uh, for facilitating this, uh, this session. I'd, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have at this time. Um, feel free to ping me offline on LinkedIn as well at any time if you'd like to um, chat further about anything specific. Um, back to you, Anu and Sharath and Sandhya. Uh, hi, Kumar. Thanks so much. It's a very insightful session. Uh, I'm sure we have a lot of questions. There's one question in the chat. I'm not sure if you can be able to see it. Rudala, do you want to unmute and sh ask the question or do you want me to read it out? Yeah, sure. I would be happy to. Hello, Kumar. It was a wonderful session and it was very insightful. So this is one question I have uh, pondering over for quite some time that how does a company evaluate the contributions made by non revenue generating team, like uh, the documentation or the UX team? Um, and when does a company consider uh, such teams as a overhead and wants to downsize it? Awesome question, Madhila. And when someone says awesome question after a presentation, it usually means they don't know the answer. And, <laughs> and that's true in my case as well. Uh, I wish I knew. Um, so you basically are asking if I'm in a cost center, um, how is my value determined, right? How is my productivity and exactly, yeah, uh, all that determined? So I know different companies do it differently, and justifying the very existence of technical communication has as a function is often an uphill task. And um, I think this is not this is true not just of technical communication, uh, if that's any consolation, but it's true for any kind of non-core support function, if you will. Uh, mm -hmm. Being part of being embedded in the product team, I think helps us demonstrate value more easily. If uh, we are a little remote from the product development teams, um, and if you're kind of disconnected from sales, then that can be more uh, challenging. And yeah. uh, I'm hoping that some of the more experienced managers and leads in this group can actually answer your question better. That's That's the maximum that I can offer at this point. Okay, thank you. No problem. Yeah, so I think even as Kumar said, if any of the other, you know, senior leaders want to also take a shot at giving their perspective, please do. Also want to remind folks, uh, Sharath has just put in the feedback link in the chat. Uh, please do fill that in because that's required for if you want to get a certification for attending the session. Uh, so my take on this question, um, yeah, as Kumar said, uh, the it's not always transparent and it all depends on the company. One way uh, documentation is measured is a uh, cost of uh, tech support, right? Uh, avoid it. So if, um, <clears throat> so that's like a, as called the most concrete cost or return on investment you can get, right? So uh, if we can show that uh, some tech support dollars have been avoided because people have you know, gone to documentation instead. Um, so that is, uh, you know, an actual value. Um, so I think that that helps us to understand that, yes, we have to be concerned also about customer queries, troubleshooting, and, you know, customer pain points. And, you know, the look at ways uh, either in the documentation or as value add and how we can tackle those because that helps us, you know, uh, provide our value. And yeah, and that's a very useful tip. Like, yeah, being embedded in definitely being embedded with, uh, you know, the product teams, R and D, um, being close to that, then you're considered part of the core team. So I think that is helpful. Does anyone Thank else have That was awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah probably. I'd like to. Add, right? um, I think for any cost center, the first evaluation is 
about budget versus actual cost, right? So that's how a cost center is evaluated. Overall, in the budget of uh, the organization, um, the cost center features as a percentage. Now, um, expanding on what Sandhya said there, when you consider, uh, let's say, support costs going down because of contribution of DOC, uh, that will again show up in terms of these percentages in the overall game. So if you say that my support cost was 10% and it's now 9% because I increased my DOC expenses from 5% to 6% or whatever is that ratio that works out, I think that's how we show value uh, in the uh, costing aspects of it. But usually a cost center is only evaluated based on budget versus actuals. Yeah. Thanks, Sachin. Anu, you wanted to say something? Yeah, no, just uh, extension of what you both just said. Uh, uh, Sandhya, uh, valid point. Uh, I think um, another way uh, that we can um, show the value of technical documentation is also the product adoption and the speed, right? Um, at which customers uh, adopt uh, new products. Um, another way is, of course, the support uh, and also their reliance on documentation. Uh, the third uh, sort of very, like at a more finite level is actually then, you know, just the plain number of visitors, right? Like, like the people who access documentation um, and then uh, return it uh, and, and then come back uh, and visit uh, uh, documentation and refer to it uh, uh, repeatedly, right? So those are some techniques that uh, you can use uh, data. Uh, from time perspective, time for adoption, as well as, you know, uh, uh, usage metrics itself. Very valuable Thank insight. You. Thanks. Hello. Yeah. Any other questions for Kumar? And also any feedback, anything else that you would like in future sessions? Uh, we take all the inputs and we will be, we use that, you know, to determine our curriculum. I think one comment that I had uh, was, uh, you know, very insightful, Kumar, firstly, because a lot of, uh, I think, finance sessions often, even for managers or for, tend to be just breaking down, you know, what a balance sheet is, what is profit and loss, and that's about it. But I think your session was very insightful as to how can we interpret it? What does it mean to us? And as you said, we've just scratched the surface. So uh, I think it will be very, uh, I would personally love to, you know, understand a lot more in some areas. I think one perspective which was very um, useful as a growth perspective, I think often uh, just as employees, we just want things to stay the same. And when there's change, you know, we kind of get rattled and it's like, okay, this product is doing uh, well and, you know, we have customers. So why are we uh, reducing uh, the cost? Why are people being moved to other projects, you know? Um, so then there is that angst, right? So why why change? But understanding the bigger picture that yeah, growth is important. Otherwise, you know, the company won't be viable. I think I found that very insightful. Thank you, Sandhya. I think um, as human beings, we are naturally a little political, right? So we yeah. we tend to see political meaning where sometimes there's no political agenda, right? So we, yeah. Sometimes the uh, the rationale is actually more logical, so it, it just takes that effort to to think a little more or talk to the right people. I agree. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, so Kumar, a uh, very uh, well put together session. I think it really simplified all the complexities of the financial analysis. Uh, but I did find some of your comments about the stock market pricing uh, uh, very interesting. So could you uh, just tell us, uh, in your opinion, right, uh, or, or the analysis that you've done uh, of the companies that you work for or were interested in, uh, how do you kind of, uh, what is your message to us in terms of looking at the basic financial ratios versus the actual stock price? Awesome question. Um, so, like I like I said during the talk, I'm not an expert in the stock market, Sachin. 
but um, uh, I whatever I share here is just my personal view. It's not science. Uh, it's not expertise. Um, I would actually not cut the stock price that much when assessing uh, financial performance. I would start with the published um, financial books and and then dig a little deeper into what are called uh, so if for example your company is listed in the US the security and exchange uh, securities and exchange commission the SEC website has these quarterly reports that companies um, publish or release and get past the numbers but look at the uh, the notes in text at the bottom and there's a section which is called risks. Um, my view is that financial analysts who uh, you know, make these buy or hold or sell decisions in the stock market typically also look at uh, those textual comments and not just at the numbers. A lot of us don't look at the text because it's, it's like fine print most of the time. But in, in that section, you'll see companies calling out specific risks item, risk items, and you'll be kind of surprised about how candid they sometimes are with identifying the kind of risks that they have in their operations. As employees, reading some of those risks might actually scare us. Um, but I think it's worth looking at it. And, and then over, over time, you rationalize, and then you say that, okay, the risk is just a disclosure. It doesn't mean that it's going to materialize, but it's good to be aware. So that's the best I can offer in terms of stock analysis and company performance analysis. Otherwise, um, from the books, you can definitely figure out things like the liquidity and the leverage, profitability and growth. I would say focus on those uh, to start with, whether you are an investor or an employee. I hope that helps, Sachin. Uh, yes, it does, Kumar. Thanks. Just a reminder, hope you've all filled in the feedback form. The link is in the chat box. Um, just I think we're at the top of the hour. Um, if there are any questions, you can always uh, send it to Kumar. Uh, we will be uploading the presentation as well as the recording soon on the Manage the Docs website. And uh, we'll also share it on our um, LinkedIn, so which is why do join LinkedIn. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, thank you, Kumar, so much for making it for the session. And, Thank you all. Uh, Thank you so much. My yeah. pleasure. Have a good Friday. Have a good weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.